Hi, welcome to Circles, a women's Bible study hosted by the Turning Point Church in Norco, California. My name is Cindy Booth, and I'm one of the pastors and teachers here at Turning Point, and we're so happy that you're joining us for our Bible study this week. We're going to be continuing in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude, and it's been such a relevant Bible study that the ladies are so much enjoying connecting with one another and God. And while we're glad that you've joined us on YouTube today, if you'd like to join a circle, a small group, you can do that every Thursday night at 7 p.m. via Zoom. And if you want that link, just go onto our church website, www.tpcnorco.com. That's tpcnorco.com. And go under events, and there'll be a simple link so you can join our Zoom Bible study live every Thursday night. And then we post it on Fridays so you can watch at your convenience on YouTube, too. Share with your friends. We'd love for you to join us. Let's grow closer to God tonight. Here we go. So open up your Bibles. We're going to go to 3 John tonight. We've been studying 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John over the last few weeks. And tonight we're going to wrap up these books and start into Jude next week. And Jude, we're really going to slow it down because Jude pops all over the place with so many, with such a variety of subjects that it's going to take us probably a good month to get to do that little teeny book of Jude. Jude is only one chapter and it's 25 verses. And so tonight we're going to look at second and third John, which is kind of like postcards in the New Testament. They're not a full letter. They're very, very short, the shortest books in the Bible. And John, the elder, the only living apostle, is the one who's written all three of these letters. And uh, second John is written, it says, to the chosen elect lady and her children. And many theologians have argued, was it a specific woman or was it uh, the church itself that he was referring to? But, and I think most agree that the elect lady that he's writing to in 2 John is probably a woman who hosted the church in her home. She opened up her home and hosted the whole church in her house. How would you like to do that every week? And uh, 3 John, he also addresses a letter to one individual named Gaius. It's spelled G-A-I-U-S. And it's a very common name in the New Testament. We know of four Gaius just in the New Testament, one that Jesus knew personally. And this is a different Gaius that he's speaking, and he refers to him as one of his dearest friends. And uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But in 2 John and 3 John, we hear over and over the word truth, truth, and truth. I think you hear it five times in 2 John, six times in 3 John. And uh, combined with love, like we talked about last week, it's a two-sided coin. You have to have truth with love and love with truth. And the balance of that is what we need to be shooting for as Christians. And John's trying to drive this home as he also discusses the problem they're having with false teachers. And so I have loved reading this in context. And I think tonight it's going to bring it all together for you. Because in First and Second John, he goes into great detail about we need discernment. We need to know what the truth is. We need to shun people who are teaching false agnostic beliefs about Jesus. They're not true. We don't want them to be in our churches and spreading uh, all this deception to others. And uh, it's, it's causing quite a stir in the church. And John is addressing these false teachers. And he wants us to be wise about who we listen to and what we read and what we expose ourselves to and accept as truth when it may not be truth at all. And so, but he, when he gets to third John, he swings the pendulum to the other side and says, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You need to be able to, I, that's the baby in the background. You probably hear her. She's got the giggles tonight. So isn't that a sweet sound? So anyway, as we go on, John uh, brings the message back around and says, look, I've warned you about all the false teachers, but now I want you to know there's a lot of good teachers out there. And there's a lot of good, godly people in your church and from other churches that will travel in from time to time that I want you to partner with. I want you to support them. I want you to receive the truth that they're sharing. They're serving Jesus like you are. And so he's saying, look, there is some false prophets, but there's also good prophets. There's false teachers, but there's some really good teachers. And so we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And for the church to be the church that Jesus is building, we need prophets, apostles, teachers, pastors, evangelists. We need all of them. And we need godly, integrous men and women who speak the truth and nothing but the truth and represent Jesus well. You know, every time I teach, every time I get into the word of God, every time I open up my mouth to share anything about Jesus, I want to be really careful that I'm representing him well. 
I don't want to speak any false truths or half truths or uh, just, you know, a portion of the truth or maybe a truth that's taken out of context. I was actually thinking about today, you know, we could even say that Paul sounds like a false teacher if you were to take some of his verses out of context. But when you put it within the context and we're good Bereans, like the Bible says, where we study the word in the context that it's giving the totality of it and understand what's really being said to us then um, that truth is the truth that sets us free. And that's our goal, isn't it, girls? We want to know the truth and we want to build our life on that truth. And then when we share the truth, we want to know that we're sharing it accurately so God is glorified and his kingdom grows and advances. Amen? All righty. Well, I can't hear you saying amen, but say it with me anyway. So anyway, uh, as we get to 3 John, I'm going to read the first few verses, and it's talking about traveling ministers right here, people that are coming into the church and visiting us from other places who are sharing what's going on in their life, and they even teach us from the word and, and share their giftings with the church to encourage them and build them up. John was one of those. He was an apostle who traveled from church to church. Paul was a missionary, traveled from church to church, planning churches, and he would come back around again and see them again, and and they received him because they had relationship with him. They knew him to be an integrous, godly person who was accurately representing Jesus. So let's go to 3 John and read the first couple of verses together. John, the elder, writes this letter and he says, I am writing to Gaius. It looks like Gaius, but it's actually pronounced Gaius. My dear friend, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are healthy in body and strong in spirit. Now, I want to push pause right there because this was a common greeting and prayer people gave each other. Like, hey, how you doing? Or, you know, God bless you. Or, uh, hope everything's going okay. It was just that kind of a greeting. And so he's saying to them, look, I hope that your body's healthy and your soul is healthy and your spirit is healthy, that your, your whole being is growing and that you're prospering. And I've, I've heard a lot of people actually take this verse out of context many, many times. I, I may have done it to myself in the early days when I was a young Christian, but this is not a promise of God. We have many promises, over 7,000 of them in the Bible, but this one is not one of the promises of God. It's a prayer. It's a greeting. Uh, it's not a guarantee that we're going to be healthy even as our soul prospers. He's saying, I'm praying that you're healthy even as your spirit is growing and your soul is growing. But the reason I bring this up is that I've heard people actually feel guilty for being sick at times. And like, wow, if you're sick, something must be wrong with you. In fact, remember in the early test in the New Testament church in the book of Acts, they brought a little boy to the apostles to pray for him. And people were wondering, well, who sinned? His dad, his mom, this little boy, did they sin? Why is he sick? People, people get sick and it may not have anything to do with sin at all. We live in a, live in a a world where there's things like coronavirus and anybody can get it, saved or not saved. And, uh, and so this is not a promise that says, look, when you're healthy, then you better be, pro if you're prospering in your spirit, then you're healthy. But if you're not healthy, that's a sign that you're not growing. But that's a lie. So let's just make, I just push pause here because I just wanted to give you a good example of how people can twist the truth when they take it out of context. This is just an opening greeting of John's to the church. He's saying, hey, I hope you're healthy. When you get this letter, I hope you're healthy and strong and prospering just as your soul is prospering because that's what I've heard and keep it up. So sorry to get sidetracked on that, but I just was thinking about that today because I've heard a lot of people take this, this verse out of context and we just need to be good brands and just know what the word of God is saying and quote it accurately. So let's go on. Verse three, some of the traveling uh, teachers recently returned and made me so happy by telling me that you've been so faithful and that you're living according to the truth. I could have no greater joy than to hear my children following the truth. Now he's saying my children, but he's not talking about his biological kids. He's talking about my children, you, the church, my brothers and sisters. John feels so um, akin to them, so fatherly toward them, so protective of them. And we've seen this all through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He's referring to them over and over as my little children. And he's saying, I have no greater joy than I, when I hear that my children are walking in the truth, following in the truth. You know, it's not enough that we know the truth. We've got to walk in the truth and live according to the truth of God. Amen? All right, so verse 5, I'll keep going. Dear friend, 
you are being faithful to God. Now, remember, he's talking to Gaius, not to all of us. He's just talking to one man, Gaius. He says, dear friend, Gaius, you've been faithful to God when you care for traveling teachers who pass through, even though they're strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God, for they are traveling for the Lord. So he's saying these are good teachers. Their work is for the Lord and it pleases God. And they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so they can be our partners that teach the truth. So he's saying, look, I want you to not only financially support them, but I want you to encourage them and partner with them and, and give them the help that they need so they can keep traveling and helping more than just your church, but many churches with encouraging them and growing them. So there's a lot of good teachers out there. And he's telling Gaius, I'm so pleased that you've shown them hospitality. I want you to keep doing this. It pleases God. I told you all about the false teachers, but you're recognizing the good teachers and you're receiving them with love. And God is so pleased with you. So that's basically what he's saying right there. So Gaius is a good guy. But then he shifts gears and he's going to make a contrast to a guy who's not hospitable. This guy is hostile. And uh, so let's pick it up in verse uh, five is where we left it off. Dear, uh, I'm sorry, is that where we left it off? Yeah, no, verse nine. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm with you. I wrote this to the church about this, but Diotrephus, what a name, Dio, let's just call him Dio tonight, okay? So easier for Cindy, but his name is Diotrephus. We're going to call him Dio. So he says, but there's a person in your church who loves to be a leader. He loves to be number one. He refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I'll report to you some of the things he's been doing and the evil accusations or gossip that he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome good traveling teachers, but he also tells others not to help him. So he not only doesn't show hospitality to good godly ministers, but he says he encourages other people to join on his bandwagon and not to be hospitable. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. So he's been very divisive. He wants to be number one, the head honcho, the attention's on him. And he doesn't want to share the limelight with anybody else, for sure, these traveling teachers. And then I'll just wrap up here in verse, um, gosh, it's such a little print. Verse 11, dear friend, don't let these bad examples influence you. So he uses a good example, Gaius, and then he gives a bad example in Dio, Diotrephus. And he's saying, what a contrast between the two. One shows hospitality. The other one is hostile. One shows empathy and compassion. The other one shows apathy. He doesn't care about anybody else but himself. One cares for others and the other one cares for himself. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna take a quick drink. So tonight, I just want to hone in on this word hospitality, because it's all through the New Testament church. And it's something we need to cultivate in the church today, because I believe the gift of hospitality just may be the sharpest tool in our kit to win this lost world, this hurting world for Jesus. Because hospitality, the very definition of hospitality, I think, is just loving well. That to me is what hospitality means. It's not just baking cookies and taking them over to a sick friend. That's part of it. But hospitality is just loving other people well, even more than we love ourselves. Uh, the dictionary says that hospitality is to show love and affection to a guest or a stranger. It's to make someone else feel at home, valued, important, received, loved. I uh, actually was talking to a lady the other day who had visited Caleb and Jennifer's new home. And we were talking about how blessed God had given them this house and, and how happy we were for them. And she said, you know, Cindy, I, I was in their little house that they came from before they moved into this little bit bigger, nicer home. And even in the little home, Jennifer always made me feel so welcome, so valued, so important. And she goes, and actually the word she used was, when I entered their home, I felt peace. She had made a, a house a home. And that's a privilege we ladies have, and that we can set the tone and the atmosphere in our home and be hospitable. It's not how perfect everything looks in your house. You don't have to have fresh flowers and the vase and the nice furniture and all that. You know, for the first 10 years of my marriage, you know what my dining table was? It was a, a folding table from Home Depot. And I just put a tablecloth over it to make it look nice. 
and we had folding chairs all the way around it because we couldn't wait to start being hospitable with others until we could afford a dining table. And uh, I prayed for a dining table and God finally did give me one. In fact, I think I've given a few away and gotten a few new ones over the years. But you don't have to wait until you get a table to be hospitable. You don't even have to wait till you have a home to show hospitality. You don't have to wait till you're married to show hospitality because God wants us showing hospitality, not just in our homes, but also in the church, in the community, in our workplaces, because remember hospitality is loving well, making other people feel welcomed, valued, important. You know, in the, there's variations of the word that help you understand what it means. We get the word hotel, hospice, hospital, all those represent places where you're going to get cared for, where you're going to be waited on, where you're a, a VIP, where they roll out the red carpet for you and, and take care of you. And that's what we want people to know when they come near our lives, is that when we welcome them into our homes, into our church, into uh, our workplace, wherever, wherever we are, we need to be rolling out the red carpet and, and elevating people and not tearing them down like Diotephus did, Diotrephus, Dio. Okay, so John, uh, you know, John is telling us that hospitality is part of the kingdom culture. When we come into the kingdom of God, all of our cultures bow to the kingdom culture. Kevin talked about this last Sunday. And John is reminding us, look, hospitality is a big deal. And it's part of the culture of heaven. Uh, I grew up in the South. The South is very proud of Southern hospitality. And they are, they're very warm in the South. They're good cooks. They put out big spreads of food. They have parties and fellowship and picnics and fun. And I mean, they're very hospitable. Neighbors help one another. I was talking to my brother and mom this last week with the big ice storm in Dallas. It was just, bless me so to hear how many people, how many neighbors come together to help one another in a great time of need. And that's hospitality. And people don't forget hospitality. Let me tell you, when you show someone true, genuine hospitality, and they feel valued and loved, they don't easily forget it. Hospitality is, is to me, puts the di di on display the love of God. Let me say that more clearly. It displays the love of God when we show hospitality. They see Jesus at work in our lives. And the way that it, the reason that is, is because it's not about us. Where whatever we're doing in the moment, whatever we're communicating in the moment, whatever we're, is showing hospitality, whatever way we're doing it, it's not about us. It's about someone else. It's about honoring them, valuing them, respecting them, helping them, caring for them. And uh, that's how Jesus lived. In fact, he said, the greatest among you will be a servant. Remember him washing the feet and telling the disciples, look, I've served now. I want you to be a servant too. He says, I want you to pick up your cross every day, die to yourself and live to serve me and love others. Uh, Luke 6.31 says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Matthew 22.28 says, love others as you love yourself. Philippians 2.3, consider others more important than you consider yourself. These are all foundational truths that we build our life of hospitality on. So true hospitality puts God's love on display. People see his empathy. They see his compassion. They see his grace. They see his generosity. They see his giving heart, his serving heart through our hospitality. You know, hospitality means to become a way of life. Uh, I love to study other people that are very hospitable and live it well. And I have many of them, many of you in my life have taught me many things. And let me tell you, they're the Martha Stewarts of the church. And I watch how they set their tables and greet people at the door. And I mean, just all kinds of things to make me feel important when I'm around them. And I think I'm going to copy that when I, when I show hospitality to somebody else. But tonight, I just want to help you expand your definition of hospitality because it has more, it has a lot more to do than just setting out the coffee and donuts at church on Sunday morning. Hospitality is anytime we love others well or elevate others. Now, remember the opposite of that was hostility. Hospitality elevates people. Hostility pulls people down. You've been around people like that, haven't you? People like Diotrephus, who are just gossips and backbiters and dividers, and, and they want to be number one, and they want to be noticed and all that. And who wants to hang around those kind of people? I want to be around people like Gaius, you know, and John, who are loving and tender, and they're serving one another, and they're just falling all over themselves to show hospitality 
to one another and not just the saints. I want you to get this. They didn't just show hospitality to their brothers and sisters and people that loved them back. They loved strangers. They loved traveling ministers that were coming in that they may never never see again, but they did it as unto the Lord and it pleased God so much. So tonight, I just want to wrap up by telling you what is radical hospitality? What does it look like in our lives today? Because this is something, girls, that we can start applying to our lives right now, right now tonight, okay? So the first thing is that to have a a lifestyle of hospitality, you need to cultivate a heart of empathy where you put yourself in someone else's shoes and you try to imagine what would it feel like if I was that person and what can I do to help them, to lift them up, to show them how important and valued they are, how loved they are. And so I always picture like if I see a visitor coming into church, I try to uh, imagine myself, what would it feel like if I was brand new in church today and I didn't know anybody else and I didn't know where the restrooms were and I didn't know where my kids go and and they take a little break in the middle of the service to go get coffee and donuts and I don't even know where the coffee and donuts are and everybody's talking to one another but nobody's talking to me and so I try to imagine and have empathy for all of our first-time believers and I hope you guys do that with me too. We want to have a warm church and so to do that we have greeters at the door We have ushers that set up the chairs. We have people that come through and clean the place so it's nice and welcoming to them. We have the coffee going, the donuts going. And it takes many people to be involved in that. And so we need to, it starts with empathy by us just imagining what would it be like to be a visitor? And then we roll out the red carpet and show them hospitality. We do it in all the areas of our life. I'm just giving you one example. Another thing is we look for opportunities to show hospitality. We don't just have empathy, but we actually look for, okay, now that I have compassion for them and empathy for them, what can I do to make them feel important and loved? I want them to feel valued. I want them to feel honored. I want them to feel respected. And I want them to experience the love of God. And so let's go back to the visitor, a visitor at church again, okay? So I'm going to find a chair for them. I'm going to walk them to a chair. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee for them. Uh, When Kevin takes the intermission during the service, I'm going to run back and get a cup of coffee, not for me, but for a visitor and uh, bring it to them and share with them. I'm going to help them get their kids and the kids rock and offer to walk with them and get the kids settled in. And uh, after service, when I see the visitors, a little family that's new to us that nobody talking to or knowing, I'm going to pop myself down next to them and I'm going to talk to them and I'm going to learn their names and repeat their names so they know they're valued. And they're being loved. See, that's what hospitality is. And I'm giving to you just this one example, but we'll get some more in a few minutes. Just hold on. So we put ourselves in their shoes and have empathy. We look for opportunities to show hospitality. And the next one is be grateful when someone shows you hospitality. You know, I feel when somebody says thank you to me, it makes me want to do that all the more. You know, when somebody says, boy, I really liked those yams you made at the potluck tonight. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home and I'm going to write out that recipe by hand and I'm going to send it to them in the mail or I'm going to text it to them because I want to go that extra step to show them the love. They, I value them. I appreciate being uh, appreciated and it makes me want to be more hospitable in the future. So say thank you to people that are being hospitable to you, that are showing kindness to you and uh, let them know that you've been blessed and fan that flame of hospitality among us. So another thing is, is that let's work together showing hospitality. Um, Let's go back to our example with the church again. At church, it's not a one-man show. It was never meant to be three women in the church doing all of the work at a potluck. Or, uh, you know, we're supposed to work in team, guys. And many hands make the work light. And nothing delights the Lord more. When we come together and work in unity with one another and in harmony with one another. And to me, that's so important in the body of Christ. Remember, harmony is made by different notes coming together and making a pretty sound, a chord. And so God's made all of us different. Every one of us have a different gifting. And when I function in my gift and you function in your gift and we all come together and we serve in a hospitable, loving way in the body of Christ, what happens is we make harmony. And it's 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 a sweet fragrance to the Lord and to the world. And so in our hateful, divided world, what a contrast we can be as a church as we stand in hospitality and love week after week, not just on Sunday morning, 
but all throughout the work week, let's work together to show hospitality one to another. Amen. All right. Well, I could go over and over on it, but, but I'm telling you right now, it, when you come to church, you don't have to have a job or a task. Just look around. There's plenty to do and get involved. If you don't know where to get involved at, come and ask me because we need everybody hands on deck. We're growing. People are coming back after this pandemic and we need people to get involved again and build together again. And uh, let, for example, last week I was watching and, and uh, we had pictures taken outside for Valentine's Day. And you know what happened with that? How many people that took to get those pictures taken? Well, it took Georgie and uh, Charlie, and I'm trying to get all the names. Let's see what else. Uh, Shauna Garcia, they got that board background all decorated for you ahead of time. And then Sarah Esterson and Micah and Georgie got involved getting the camera out and uh, making sure and taking down names so that we can make copies and give them to your family the next week. And then after that, Micah Joy came in on Monday and spent hours editing the pictures. I think as Sarah also helped with the editing on that too. And then they had to send them away to be printed and somebody had to go to the store and pick up those prints. I could go on and on and on, but you're getting the picture. It takes many hands just to do one task in the church, but we wanted to do it because it's showing hospitality. It's showing every family, especially our new families, you're important to us. We love you. We want to do this for you. And so when we come together and do it, think of what all we can do if all of us get involved. Amen. Don't be just a pew sitter. Let's all get involved. Let's not be like Dio who just sat on the side and gossiped and complained about everybody else. But let's be like Gaius who gets involved and shows hospitality. And then finally, I just want to remind you that when we show hospitality to people, it leaves a lasting impression. People remember it. I look back over my life and it just it pops up. The memories immediately pop up, but they will for you too right now if you think about it. I remember when I first had the twins, I know exactly who brought me meals to this day. They're 34 years old and I know who brought me meals and who brought me a yogurt. I remember Terry Barr coming over and let me go take a shower. I hadn't a shower in three days because I just was exhausted with two baby twins at home. And I remember the hospitality and the help people gave me. It made me feel important and loved and helped me get through a difficult season. When you take a meal to a, a, to a young mom who just had a baby or a meal to someone who is sick or to call up somebody and say, I want to pray for you. I was praying for you today and I want to pray for you right now. And God gave me a verse for you. Just that little word of encouragement. That's showing hospitality and love to someone else and showing value. Remember my, when my kids were in junior high, we would drop them off in the morning at junior high. And there'd be, you know, the long line of cars going through every single morning between 7 30 and 8 15 for 45 minutes the principal of that public school junior high stood outside and greeted every child by name and i mean i i don't know if he was a christian or not but it's like you pulled up he had a smile on his face he opened their door good morning cindy it's so good to see you today hey mom how you doing have a good day and i'm just thinking what a hospitality rolling out the red carpet opening up the door and showing hospitality. I remember that to this day. That's 20 years ago. And I remember that gift of hospitality that he had. It left a, an impression on me. Just think what we could do as a church to leave an impression on others when we're showing hospitality and love to them. When Kevin and I travel, we get on an airplane, fly 30 hours to Africa. I can't tell you how nice it is to arrive at the house of people we don't even know and to go into the bedroom that they have set up for us. And sometimes... It's, it's a very small house, but they've cleaned and they put the bed sheets on the table and a, a nice uh, basket with some stacks and water bottles in it because we're jet lagged and we're going to be awake in the middle of the night. And their children have made banners that say welcome and they're hanging on the wall and fresh flowers have been cut and put beside our bed. I mean, all those little touches of hospitality make me feel, wow, it was worth the 30 hour flight here. I'm so glad I've been so received here. I'm in a family's home now. I've known these people for five minutes and I feel like family. I feel at home. I feel important. I feel valued. See, that's hospitality. And by the way, the gift of hospitality is Holy Spirit anointed. We don't, it's just like raising somebody from the dead. It's miraculous. We don't do it in our own strength. I pray when I show hospitality, you should too, and say, Lord, what should I cook these people that are coming over for dinner? What sh how should I do this? And, and when should I do this? And God will show you opportunities of hospitality and he'll anoint you for it and give you creative ideas. Won't that be fun?
All right, we're going to close tonight by backing up and going to Romans. And because as we finish John's three letters on love and truth and just what the early church should look like, I think it's summed up really well by Paul back in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm going to skip down to verse 9 and read it to you. And he talks about hospitality in here, but he just talks about just the whole atmosphere of love that should be happening in the kingdom culture of the church. Such a good description to us. So we're going to read from verse 9 to 18 and close with this tonight. Romans 12, 9. I'm just glancing at my time. Okay, don't just pretend to love others. I'm reading again. NLT. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Verse 10. Love one another with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. That's what we've been talking about, honoring and elevating one another. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Verse 12. Rejoice in the confident hope. Be patient in trouble, keeping on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them, always eager to practice hospitality. Okay, let's go on. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who cry. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be proud to enjoy the company of just, don't be so proud that you don't enjoy the company of ordinary people. In other words, don't puff yourself up to where you won't sit amongst the children or visitors or strangers. Love everybody just the same. And he says, and don't think you know it all, <laughs> okay? Never back, give back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with one another. So just going back over this, I look at such good handles. These are just good practical handles. And to me, it's, it sums up the whole uh, way that we wanna show hospitality one to another, not just traveling teachers that are coming into the church. We've got one this Sunday, Dave and Kathy Swartz, but um, just showing one another, just it, it doesn't matter our age or our background or how well we know one another, we can show the gift of hospitality to one another and it honors God and it shows off God's love to them. So just briefly going back over this passage, Romans 12, 9 through 18, verse 9, right away, he says, don't love with hypocrisy. Let your love be genuine and real. No lies or deception. Don't be manipulative. Just in truth, love one another. Believe the best about one another. And then in verse 10, it says, be kindly affectionate with one another, showing each other preference, tenderhearted, forgiving, kind, uh, listening, really listening to one another, preferring one another, honoring, respecting. That's the culture of the kingdom. Verse 11, it, it goes on and says, I want you to do this for Jesus. I want you to serve and forgive and share. Remember, it was Jesus who said, even when you give a cup of water, and this is hospitality, when you just give a cup of water to somebody, I notice it. And it's like, I acknowledge it as if you gave me the cup of water. That's what Jesus says. Let that sink in. So when we show hospitality, Jesus takes it personally. And he says, you just did that unto me. And it pleases him and it honors him. Helps build the church. Helps exalt our king. Shows off his love. Verse 12 says, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. That's something we've been learning this year, isn't it? So we're slow to anger, but we're long suffering. I mean, we, sitting by a sick friend's bedside for hours or a friend that's crying or grieving and we don't have to talk. We don't have to say anything. We just sit there with them. Let me tell you, that's hospitality because you're valuing them to just be there, to hold their hand and just to be present and to listen to them if they want to talk. Faithful, loyal love. Verse 12 says, don't stop praying. Keep praying for one another. I mean, really be honest with yourself. Are you praying for your brothers and sisters? Have you thought about the girls that are in your circles group each week, this week? Have you prayed for them by name? Have you lifted them up to the Lord? I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. I'm just admonishing you. Come on, church, let's grow up. Let's take the word of God and apply it to our lives. And right here, he's telling us, don't ever stop praying. Keep praying for one another. It's important. Verse 13, distribute needs to one another by showing the gift of hospitality. We've already talked about that. Helping a friend move, uh, helping a friend paint their bathroom at home, uh, lending a car, paying for dinner, uh, sending an encouraging note in the mail, uh, taking a meal to someone. I mean, there's just so many ways we can show hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who curse you. Big pill to swallow. 
Bless those who curse you. Don't you curse them back. Don't you seek revenge. Let the Lord deal with them. Nobody gets away with anything. The Lord will deal with them. You just stay in your lane and you be concerned with yourself. And the Bible says for us, we just do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Amen. So we don't participate in gossip. We don't listen to gossip. Uh, I personally have just made a decision. And I have gossiped many times. I'm not judging anybody. I've, I, hopefully I gossip a lot less now than I did when I was younger, but I've just made it a, a, a goal for myself to never say one bad word about a friend, never. And for, and not to judge or to criticize others because I never know the full story and it's not my place. So I'm just choosing to believe the best about everybody. And I want to pray for them and love them and honor them. And if I don't have anything good to say, I do what my mama said, and that is keep my mouth shut and that's biblical so bless them but don't you dare curse them verse 15 rejoice with those who are rejoicing i love it that we as a church i love when we celebrate one another um just an example that comes off the top of my head is i've gone to luke raestra's uh, softball game and there's four or five families from the church there cheering him on at his softball game. And I think, yay, church, we're celebrating with one another. And we're making Luke know you're important. We're valuing him. We're elevating him and letting him know he's loved. And then cry with one another. When someone cries, we weep because we feel compassion and empathy for one another. And um, we slow down long enough to mourn with others and hold their hand and give them a hug and wipe their tears away. He goes on, and just wrap up with this. He says, be at the same mind, fight for unity and harmony uh, with one another. Um, don't repay evil for evil. And as much as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. You know, we're not responsible for what anybody else is doing. We're responsible for me, myself, and I. And as far as you're concerned, you're going to answer to God. God, did I show hospitality? When people look back at my life, are they going to compare me to Gaius? Are they going to compare me to Diotrephus? Which one am I like? Am I the hostile person or am I the hospitable person? And guys, you know the truth about yourself. God knows the truth about you. And if you need to make some adjustments tonight, I hope you do. And I hope you start to share more and more hospitality, the gift of hospitality. Because I'm telling you right now, this is a great way to win your friends over to God and to exalt him just by simply loving them well and value, valuing them the way Jesus does. Amen. Such a good passage. So practical. I've loved these books. Remember, John has taken this. We don't want to take it out of context, but John has taken this big subject of love in the church. And he says, look, I want you to love one another. I want you to love God. I want you to, to stand in truth. And if anybody, any false teacher creeps into the church that distorts the truth, shut them away, put them away. But the good teachers, identify them and receive them with love and honor them and support them, partner with them, partner with one another. And let's just keep spreading the gospel of love to this dying world. We don't know how much time we've got left. I believe we're living in the last days, not the last years or decades or era even. I believe we're living in the last days and Jesus could come back anytime. He could be scooting up on the edge of his throne right now to get up and come back and get his church. But I don't want to leave anybody behind. God doesn't want us to leave anybody behind. So let's love people into the faith toward Jesus. Let's go after everybody that's far from God and let's just love them to death with hospitality. Amen.